pray. God, thank you for the gift of baptism and thank you for the gift of the body of Christ. You're really kind to us to care for your people in all kinds of ways. Lord, we need more grace this morning. We need grace to hear your word. We need grace to understand your word. We need grace to do your word. Lord, help me. Help me. In, you've helped me in preparation, I believe. Help me now in speaking your word. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Well, by way of introduction, after doing 60 or 80 baptisms here, you know, I baptized my own son and uh, forget to ask him the questions, you know. Right now, are you trusting in Jesus Christ alone for the forgiveness of your sins, the fulfillment of all God's promises to you, even eternal life? Or do you renounce Satan and all of his works and all of his ways? And do you intend with God's help to obey Jesus' teaching and follow him as your Lord? And I didn't ask him those questions. We're still going to count the baptism, though. <laughs> because I asked him after I realized, after Dave came up and asked Rebecca that, that I forgot. He said yes to all three. So, he's, amen, amen. Only a miracle. Now, the text today speaks to what the church is and what the church ought be doing in regards to kind of itself. You see the, uh, the title, This Church Has a Warranty, God's Plan for Church Growth. Originally, the title was, If He Builds It, Will You Come? Somebody said that's kind of a deep cut on Kevin Costner movies. So I thought, okay, maybe I don't want to explain Field of Dreams. So... But I think this text speaks to two things. It speaks to the maintenance of a church. I don't mean like the maintenance of this building, which Steve Rindy is great at. I mean maintenance of the body of Christ. And it also speaks to God's growth plan. I don't know if you own a home. It's kind of hard to buy a home these days. Mortgage rates, am I right? Sorry, renters. You might be stuck for a while. But in heaven, you've got a home, y'all. And in the new heavens and new earth to come. You probably have experiences, though, with warranties. A warranty, which you purchase something, and then a warranty is meant to provide a measure of coverage, so if it breaks, you can repair it or replace it, right? And everybody's got a body. You got a body? Bob, you got a body? Yeah. We've all got bodies, right? So we know what it means for a body to grow. These two analogies about a building that needs maintenance and a body that needs maturing are determinative for our passage. So we're going to ask the question, what does God do to maintain his house, the church? What does God do to grow his house, the church, his body? Well, let's remind ourselves briefly of where we've been, where Dave has taken us as we've gone through the first three chapters of Ephesians. Chapter one, we see this beautiful salvation in the grand scheme of God that transcends time and space and Paul's prayer that the church might get it. Right? And then he goes in chapter 2, and he says, there's a dividing wall between heaven and earth destroyed in Christ. Oh, there's a dividing wall between Jews and Gentiles horizontally destroyed in Christ, torn down. The church is a first taste of a brand new creation. And then chapter 3, the church is not just this new thing. It is new. But it's not just this new thing like, you know, the eternal God someday was like, oh, Israel failed. Let's do something different. Didn't happen that way. The church was always God's plan. Always God's plan to display his glory to all of creation. And then, as we heard last week, we need more power. We need more strength to comprehend the love of Christ. So the division between up and across accomplished in Christ. And what our passage is about today is how might that taste of heaven stay on earth? How might there be if heaven came down in Christ and intersected with earth, how might there be anchor points to keep those two together? That's what our text is about. God himself has designed the church in a certain way that if we ignore it, the unity that's actually ours in Christ would go to waste and we will miss a part of the joy we're supposed to have. So we're going to dive in. And before we do, I'm going to ask for more help, more grace. So God, help even as we 
pour through this text, let it pour over us in a way that we feel equipped. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. First, we're going to see the source of this warranty, as it were, my words, or growth plan. The source is God himself. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. I hope you've got a Bible. If you don't have a Bible with you, either on your phone or a physical one you brought, there are physical Bibles in the seat back in front of you or nearby you. Ephesians 4, verse 1. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There's one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. If you spent time reading uh, epistolatory letter, you know, stuff in the New Testament, you know that therefore is kind of a big deal. Paul, in the entire book of Ephesians thus far, has not given a single command to obey, except for in chapter 2, verse 11, when he tells them you need to remember something. Okay, remember like what you used to be as Gentiles. All right. And now there's going to be a litany of commands from chapter 4, verse 1, through the very end of the book. This is really common in Paul. Having kind of laid the foundation, as it were, for his argument, Paul is going to show how this church is maintained, the body is maintained, how oneness and unity is maintained. If chapter 1 through 3 is Paul in an advertisement, this is the church, y'all. Chapter 4, verse 1 is the beginning of the owner's manual. This is what it means to have a church. How do you go about being the church? In chapter 4, verse 1, all the way through to the end of the book. Therefore means on the basis of everything that came before, the grounds of chapters 1 through 3 and all that God has done in Christ for you, church, he says you should walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called. Verse 1. If God has done all this and we just kind of shrug our shoulders, oh yeah, thanks God. And we don't see what he's designed the church to be and to do, we're not getting it. Paul says we should walk in a it makes sense kind of way. We should walk along with what God is doing, not against it. Now this walking metaphor is going to be a controlling metaphor for much of the rest of the book. So Paul already used it once in chapter 2, verse 10. Well, I'll just read chapter uh, 2, verses 8 through 10. So you can just turn back with me. Paul said, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So there's good works that God has prepared, and part of that is walking in a manner worthy. And then Paul grabs that and uses that walking analogy four more times in chapters 4 and 5. This is chapter 4, verse 17. Now I, this I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. Or chapter 5, verse 2, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Or chapter 5, verse 8, at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light. Or chapter 5, verse 15, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise. So what does it mean to walk in the good works God has prepared for us? What does it mean to walk in a manner worthy of his calling? Well, it looks like don't walk like in the futility of your minds, like unbelievers who don't know God. It means walk in love. It means walk in light and truth. It means walk in wisdom, not no wisdom, foolishness. And all of this is fuel for what God is doing and maintaining his church and keeping it unified. Now, here in this text, in chapter 4, you see the descriptions that Paul puts on this command. Verse 2, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. This is the fruit of the Spirit from Galatians 5. This is, how, how do you maintain the, the unity of the Spirit? You walk as Christ walked. 
man, I can't live up to that. Can you live up to that? Anybody? Anybody? You can't. And yet, in a sense, there is a direction of the life of the Christian that walks in step with Jesus, though it's not perfect. How can that, how can that be accomplished? The answer is in our text. All right, we're going to keep going. We'll keep, keep rolling with this. All right. The manner in which they're to do it, there in verse 3, is eager, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. All of this is out of a heart that's eager for this. The oneness that's coming from God himself, yes, this unity must be maintained, and it's not a status quo kind of like it just stays the same all the time. It requires maintenance. That maintenance, I don't know about you, but when an appliance breaks... Eagerness is not the thing that I would describe about, you know, my hot water heater busting and leaking all over the basement or whatever else. But this particular kind of, as it were, maintenance has a description of eagerness. What are you eager to do every day? Think about it. What are you eager to do? If you're an extrovert like me, maybe you're like, spread my wings. I'm eager to be with people. If you're an introvert, maybe you're more like, stay at home, eager to have my book or whatever. I mean, for me, every morning for years and years and years, I'm eager to get up and make my cup of coffee the exact one way that I love it. It's eager. I look forward to it. Maybe you're like, you're probably addicted to caffeine, Daniel. That may be true. Okay. Eagerness is the label that he puts on it because I think Paul is trying to show that this unity and what we're supposed to do about it, we're supposed to proactively do something about it, not just react when things are hard. You should be eager to act in accord with God's plan. What is he doing? In the brokenness of the world, God is doing a mending and he's starting it in the church. God is doing healing and he's starting in the church. Where did the grace come to walk this way? God. God. That's what 4 through 6, chapter 4, verses 4 through 6 and about. Paul starts telling them about oneness. Unity based around there being one church body, one spirit, one Lord, one faith, one Baptist, one God and Father of all. Rhetorical question. Is God one? Yes. He's also three and one. That's true. Okay, but he is one. He's unified. If God is one, the church has a unity to it. Is God one? Yes. Then our faith is shared. Is God one? then become what you already are, Church of Christ. What you already are, because you're connected to Christ by faith, is, in a sense, you are unified in him. Work on it. In the power that he supplies. Work on it. Now, God goes about doing this not by making us all carbon copies of each other so that we all just get along in that way. God's warranty plan, as it were, his growth plan, comes in two parts. And the first part is what we see in the second point here, the servants. This is chapter 4, verse 7 through verse 11. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean? But that he also descended into the lower regions of the earth. He who descended is the one who also ascended far above the heavens that he might fill all things. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers. With the conjunction, but God is trying to, or Paul, God and Paul, is trying to make a a distinction here. Do you see the play on words? God is one, but he has given to each one a distribution of various gifts. We share a lot in common in our faith. But God did something in giving the church a lot of gifts to complete this mission. All this oneness was not just a cookie cutter in God's design, although maybe some of us look like each other. Like maybe God took Nathan, you know, a bigger version, and then he like compressed it down, and then he made me. I don't know. Possibly. Okay. No, he, he distributed gifts that are different and varied, which shows us something about God. How delightful and diverse in his oneness is our God? Look around. Look around. Consider the body of Christ the world over. 
God in his oneness is not a boring God, y'all. He is exciting. He is the one whom we will get to know for eternity. If you can imagine getting to know all the millions, perhaps billions of Christians that have ever lived for all of eternity. Maybe you're an introvert. You're like, oh, maybe not. Okay, all right. It, it'll be okay, I promise. How much more than the God that created all of them for all of eternity? Now, after telling us that he has a gift for us, he quotes Psalm 68, 18, or at least part of it, to remind the Ephesians how this gift came about. It says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. Psalm 68 pictures God coming down from his mountain and waging war and then taking a train of captives back up the mountain, kind of having captured them. And at least in our Hebrew version of the Old Testament and the Greek version that we have, it does not say he gave gifts to men. It says he received gifts from men. Now, there's a couple of other versions, Syriac, Peshatta, uh, the Hebrew uh, Bible translated into uh, another Middle Eastern language. Uh, the, the rabbis uh, apparently had some quote like this. But Paul apparently is not directly quoting Psalm 68. There's a handful of English translations that chop off right after the comma, and then they put in that Paul is giving a, an interpretive gloss Maybe, maybe not. Whatever Paul is doing here, he's extrapolating the idea of Psalm 68 by looking at the ministry of Christ and saying, here's what happened in Christ. Okay? Christ took captives and then turned around and gave gifts. This is a picture of a train of triumph. This is different than what's in Colossians, where... Uh, Christ captures demons and then leads them kind of to a slaughter, okay? This is an interesting twist and picture on a Roman victory triumph. If you know anything about a Roman victory triumph, we have loads of records about them. Rome would conquer a people. They would capture their kings and their significant people, usually their families. They would take them back to Rome where they would go through the colonnade and everything else all the way to the seat of the Roman emperor. And then they would kill their opponents and their family in front of the cheering crowds. That's the Roman victory parade. In the Jesus victory parade, what does he do? He dies for his enemies first, captures them away from the power of sin, and then... He doesn't just take them away to be with him for forever. He gives them back as gifts. Gifts to the church. I think that's the point here. The gifts are not like spiritual gifts. They're, they're people. I think that's true because of the last verse here. The gifts aren't a what, but a who. Two parts to a warranty plan. Two parts to God's growth plan. First, a list of people. The apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers... Who are all these people? Well, I've got a page and a half to tell you who they all are. And I'm not going to tell you who they all are. I'm going to say this, though, all right? All of these various ministries have something in common, okay? The apostles came, and they were promised the Spirit would remind them everything that Jesus said so they could write it down. The prophets came, not just like, you know, we believe in the gift of prophecy is here today, but not disconnected from God's word. It's connected to what God has already said. The evangelists uh, in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, like it appears to be like they share the gospel, God's word. And the shepherds and teachers, the last one that you see there, which is uh, the way that it's written in Greek, you're supposed to see those two together, they're massed together as not just two separate things, but two things together. What do they have? A ministry of God's word. So if I'm up here, an elder at this church, preaching to you, like, what I am saying better be from the Bible, God's word. That's right, okay? Not my own ideas, not my own inferences, God's, all right? What we're supposed to be doing as leaders in the church is ministering God's word to you. I think that's why something like deacons is not present in this list. Because deacons have been given for the sake of the unity of the church too, 
but it's not the word of God that they're ministering, right? So that's what's common between all of these, okay? So get a sense that this is a ministry, an authority, as it were, that's based upon this, the word of God. Not inherent to any person. Not like, I put on my pastor hat, listen to what I say. No, it's coming from the word of God for the sake of the people of God. What about this ministry? What about this? Well, that's where it goes. What are these gifts to the church supposed to do? They're supposed to equip a second group of people, a second part of God's warranty plan, God's growth plan. Who is that? Everybody. Everybody who's in Christ, the saints. This is the third point. He gave these gifts Verse 12, to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may be no longer children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, Speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped. When each part is working properly, it makes the body grow so it builds itself up in love. Equipped for what? The work of the ministry. What's that? Okay, the diakonos word group where we also get the noun deacon is commonly translated in every major English translation as either ministry or service. Service. To serve is to minister. So if chapters one through three kind of show the ministry of God in Christ, chapters four through six shows our ministry and service for one another in God's strength, in the power of the Holy Spirit, in local churches, in our homes, in all relationships. What does this ministry do? It helps the church grow. And part of what the ministry is doing is protecting us from false teaching. And there's lots of false teaching out there in the first century, lots of false teaching today, false teaching in the first century about you need to become a Jew in order to be a Christian, or Jesus didn't really come bodily, he was just kind of a spirit, or today that you can treat those that are your enemies actually like your enemies instead of like Christ did, or <clears throat> that sexual sin is not really sexual sin, or we don't want to be controversial about that, or that uh, babies are worth protecting in the womb, but let's not get too political about that. Wherever God's word says something, we stand on it without compromise. And sometimes there's wisdom in how it should be applied, right, in our current day and age. Loads of false teaching then, plenty of false teaching now. What's the word picture that Paul uses? He doesn't want the church to be like kids chucked into the Pacific in a floaty. You ever, been, you ever been, like, in the ocean? Kids, right? My kids went to the ocean last summer, probably for the first time. Can you imagine what it's like? You don't know how to swim. There's nobody there to help. You've got, like, floaties on here, you know. And every wave that comes along, towards the shore, away from the shore, doesn't matter. Paul wants the church not just swim, but surf. Paul wants the church to know what's right and what's wrong in the world around them so they might be protected and grow. So when you think about God's word and what it's supposed to be doing, the leaders are not the ones who are there saying, here's a floaty, here's a floaty, Ted. Here's a floaty, Phil. Here's a floaty, Sarah. No, the leaders are supposed to be swim instructors. Learn to swim, church. Learn to swim. The ministry of God's word that happens here every single Sunday should turn into a ministry of God's word that happens out there from the moment we say benediction to the moment you come back the following Sunday. And here we are again to equip you, to remind you, to prepare you. 
So that as you stand up, you say, I have the word of God present with me for my brother, for my sister. So in other words, when Dave preaches, when I preach, when anybody preaches, when Nick plays, when anybody plays music, when anything happens up here, it's not the main thing. The main thing is what's happening here in your hearts right now and then going out from here for the rest of the week. The work of ministry for the building up the body of Christ is God's plan to display his glory to the nations and like we heard last week, to demons even. We're supposed to be helping you, your families, where you're at at your workplace, in your school, love each other in speaking the truth and caring for one another. This is how everybody will know we're disciples of Jesus. This is an on-ramp to something else, not a cul-de-sac where we get stuck. The source of all this is God, and the end of all this is back to him. Now, this is a messy idea, because if you're like me, I don't have it all together. Do you have it all together? Anybody here all together? You're like, if you raise your hand, we'll talk afterwards, all right? So, because I want to know, okay? We're sinners saved by grace. We need more grace. Do you know what grace looks like according to this passage? Look left, look right, look forward, look behind you. I think that's what Paul is saying. Sometimes in our individualistic Western world, we can have such a like, like, hey, my private devo time, my prayer time, which is all essential. And then we treat the Christian life like a little bit of a superhuman, like, yeah, I can do this. I'm Iron Man. Or I don't know, take your pick whichever superhero. Well, we need to see, like, this is an Avengers situation, all right? We need multiple, if you don't get that cultural reference, don't worry about it, all right? We need to, like, we need to come together as a people for the mission. And that's awkward. That can be fearful because people are messy. You could be rejected. You could get hurt. You could try and get isolated instead. That is the next page. So how do you combat that? How do you prevent that from happening? Feast yourself on the promises of God who has promised you he will never leave you or forsake you and has put you not only as an individual Christian on the earth but placed you into a community. That's right. It's called the church. It's called the church. The promise at the center of Ephesians, and that the deepest reality beyond what you feel about yourself, what you feel about others, is what God says is true about you and about your brothers and sisters in Christ because of the gospel. All right. Somebody say amen. Say amen. amen. Thank you. Appreciate that. I'm back in Ohio again. All right. Now, there's two verbs here in verse 16, translated joined and held together. I just want you to see this, all right? They're pretty technical words that Paul uses, kind of rare words. The first is an architecture term used for place two stones together or two bricks together. But the second is a physiology term used for placing two bones together. Paul sort of shifts the metaphor now about a building. He picked that up in chapter 2, verse, uh, I end of chapter 2 about it's a temple. He's going to shift more holistically to like a body type metaphor, which he's going to use a lot in the rest of the book. Being connected, this is his point, being connected to the head, to Christ, means that the body is working as it should, it fixes itself, and it grows. Just think about what a picture of this would be like. Dave's been talking about Remy. I can talk about Gwen. Because Gwen, just a few weeks ago, was labeled by the doctor as uh, not thriving or whatever that label is. Like she was losing weight. It was uh, kind of a little bit of a scary time. Praise God, she's gaining weight now. You can continue to pray for us. What was going on? Her body was not taking in the nutrients that it should have been putting in. Things weren't working correctly, all right? But when she started to take in nutrients, take in food, what did the body do? The body has a design. It started growing, right? It started growing. This is the way the church is designed. The church is designed so that as you take in food, you would grow. What's the food? It's right here. Who has the food? Well, you do. 
but so does your brother and sister in Christ. So when someone comes close and brings this word to you in comfort, in encouragement, in confrontation, in exhortation, you need to look past them. Look past them and see what it says here. What does it say there in uh, chapter 4, verse 16? Well, the end of verse 15. Grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ. From whom? From whom? From whom the whole body, when it's rightly joined together? This ministry of the word is not just each other. This is Christ working through you. Working through you. And notice what it is. It's truth in love. Not truth or love. Like you get options depending on your personality. It's the truth of God's word presented in love. This is all the way back in uh, chapter 2 where Paul says, I don't have it here, but Paul says like, when you heard, no it's chapter 1, verse 13. I think, something like that. All right, When you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, Paul's not just talking about like random truth, like, hey, what's the facts on the internet? And then here's some truth for you. It's the truth of this. In each person's hands, on each person's lips, for the benefit of each person. When someone comes close to you with the word of God, it's Christ seeking to help you, to heal you, to seek to cleanse you of your sin. No, it doesn't give you a pass to just go around bopping people in the head with the Bible Don't do that. But you've been given the scriptures for the mutual encouragement and edification of each other. So in conclusion, do you think of yourself as no less a minister of God's word, a servant of God's word, than me? You should. You should think of yourself as, Daniel's got a job, Dave's got a job, others have a job to help equip me. But the main thing that happens is not here. It's when I go home and I spend time with my grieving neighbors who have lost loved ones but don't know Jesus. It's when I spend time encouraging you in your faith, even apart from this. Do you see, do you indeed know you were bought with a price and given a mission, South Cities? You're a part of God's warranty plan, a part of his growth plan. Consider three things to try, just in conclusion, okay? One, pray the word out loud with somebody else. Just pray the word on their behalf. Uh, Romans chapter six through eight, great passages. You can pick just about any verse. Pray them out loud for someone else. Study the word of God with someone else. Yes, we have options for that on Wednesday, but just grab somebody else and say, I've been reading... Well, I've been reading Revelation. Surprise. I mean, you you have to come back next year to uh, get some of the insights I've been gleaning. But I've been reading whatever, okay? I've been reading whatever. Would you study it with me? Or speak the word of God. Seriously. Husbands, wives, kids, singles. You're in a workplace. You're at school, wherever. Have the word of God in your heart such that it comes out your lips for the benefit of other people. People. This is a Bonhoeffer quote that I love. Bonhoeffer was a nonconformist German pastor during the rise of Nazi Germany. He said, The Christ in my own heart is weaker than the Christ in the word of another. My own heart is uncertain, but another's is sure. And what he means by that, as he goes on and explains, is my heart can vacillate subjectively. Is Christ really for me? And when you show up and you say to me, Daniel, all things work together for good for those that love God and are called according to his purpose. Daniel, God will never leave you nor forsake you. Daniel, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him freely, graciously give us everything? That's a word for you just now. And it could be a word on your lips for each other. Now, maybe you're here this morning and you're like, I don't really know where I'm at in regards to Christ. All this sounds great. How can I really know truth? like Pilate asked in the end of John 17, we would say at South City is that to reject this truth, that Jesus is truly who he said he is, is the most tragic of all things. The most tragic of all things. The Christ who created you, who made you, according to Colossians 1, 
that it comes and he offers you salvation from your sin and a whole new life that we saw pictured in these baptisms. Today can be the day of salvation. Don't leave here. Don't leave here without talking to somebody about that. I'll talk to you. I'll be out back. Talk to somebody to your left or your right. If they don't know Christ, go with them and find a Christian. His love for you in the grisly death on the cross and the glorious defeat of death and the empty tomb is worth all of your life being committed to him. In Christ, you can have a whole new family, whole new categories for everything. Your eyes can be open to see the world as it truly is. Don't let fear consume you. Christ said, don't be afraid, it is I. You can come to him. I'm out of time. I should just stop talking. No, I'm not going to do that. One last thing for us to look at together. All right, I have to ask the question, is this warranty guaranteed? Yeah. Is this a guaranteed warranty? It is. It is in a sense. This is, uh, this is like, you know, ring, 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 you know, uh, this is God. I'm here to talk about your church's eternal warranty, not just extended, okay? An eternal warranty. But we have to ask the question, if it's true for the whole church, what about individual local churches? And this is where what we know about the church in Ephesus and the rest of the Bible comes in as a beacon of both warning and hope. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 2. Okay, and this is in closing. Revelation chapter 2, the verse 7 verses. John the Apostle, having heard this letter from Jesus, tells the church in Ephesus, to the angel of the church in Ephesus write, the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your toil and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not. You found them to be false. I know you're enduring patiently and you're bearing up for my name's sake and that you've not grown weary. But I have this against you that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you've fallen, repent, do the works you did at first. And if not, I will come to you, I will remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Yet this you have, you hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Paul could say, 30 or 40 years before this is written, speaking the truth in love, you're going to help the church grow. And then John writes, you lost your first love, Ephesian church. May it not be true of us. Where we know doctrine and can identify falsehood and lose our love for Christ and each other. And if that's a downer of like an ending, well, just consider this as hope. Did Jesus just say, Done. Ephesian church? No, they were failing and he came to them and he spoke to them and he urged them. Conquer, be faithful in truth and love in Jesus, even all the way to the point of death and you will be resurrected. And that brings us to the communion table. Jesus comes to us in this. He comes to us in the table and he says to us, and as much as you eat and you drink this, you're proclaiming my death until I come back. This is a hope-filled beacon to keep pointing past our current burdens, our current trials, and yes, to help lift them, but also to say there is a day coming when Jesus will come. And if South City still exists at that time, may we be found faithful. If you're here today and you're not sure where you're at in relationship to Jesus, this is not a meal for you. This is a meal meant to show our unity in Christ. We'd ask that as everybody stands up, some of them come forward, some of them raise their hands there. And you can raise your hand if you want to receive the elements where you're at, just meditate where you're at. You do, should not feel, if you're not a follower of Jesus, like you should come forward, please. But talk to one of us. Talk to one of us. If you're here today and you're professed to be Christ, you're a brother, a sister in Christ, you're a child of God, and you're clinging to sin, clinging to sin in a way that's, well, ignoring the love that God has for you in Christ and showing that you love your sin. Consider, 
dealing with that. Make a commitment to deal with that and refrain from coming today. Or if there is brokenness, tragic, tragic brokenness in the body of Christ that needs reconciliation between somebody that's a part of you, especially if you're a part of this body and somebody else in this body, consider refraining and make a commitment in your heart that you be the proactive one to be eager to maintain the spirit of unity in the bond of peace. But if you're a sinner like me and you know you need grace, this is a meal for you. You should feel free to come. I'm going to give us just a brief moment to bow our heads and examine our hearts and then I'm going to read the words of institution and then you can come as you're ready. So let's take a moment and bow our heads. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 11, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Come as you're ready.